Hello, I'm Kalab, and I'm a second year medical student at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine. Welcome to my series on human embryology, where we'll explore the incredible journey of how each of us comes into existence. My goal for this series is simple. I want embryology to be fun, approachable, and something that genuinely enhances the way you look at the world. In this first set of videos, we'll start from the very beginning with fertilization and follow the embryo's development all the way through the formation of the vertebral column and spinal cord. I'll also be creating additional videos covering important clinical correlates with links to those provided below. Thanks for joining me and let's dive in. Around the midpoint of the menstrual cycle, hormone levels surge. Rising estrogen from the maturing ovarian follicle signals the brain to act. The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, prompting the anterior pituitary to fire off a surge of luteinizing hormone, along with a smaller boost of follicle-stimulating hormone. These hormones travel through the bloodstream back to the ovaries. When they reach their target, the message is clear. It's time to release the oocyte. The dominant ovarian follicle, swollen with fluid and tension, rises to the surface of the ovary. Its walls thin, blood flow increases, pressure builds, and then a rupture. The follicle bursts open, releasing the ovum in a rush of follicular fluid and a fine mist of blood. The egg is cast into the peritoneal space, drifting toward the sweeping fimbriae of the uterine tube. From there, it's drawn into the ampulla the wide curved portion of the fallopian tube where sperm may already be waiting. You see, sperm are survivors. While it only takes 30 minutes to a few hours for them to travel from the vagina to the egg, those that make it, and that's a rare feat in and of itself, can live up to six days within the female reproductive tract. The egg, by contrast, is fleeting. It begins to degenerate within 12 to 24 hours of release. That's why fertilization typically occurs within a day of ovulation, but it doesn't have to happen immediately after intercourse. Sometimes the sperm are already in place, just waiting. When a sperm finally reaches the egg, it binds to the zona pellucida, the egg's protective outer layer, and releases enzymes from its acrosome to help it penetrate. Once a single sperm makes it through, the egg initiates a cortical reaction altering the zona to prevent any other sperm from entering, a process known as the block to polyspermy. This penetration also triggers the egg to complete meiosis II, forming a mature ovum and ejecting the second polar body. At this point, the genetic material from both gametes merges, forming a diploid zygote. Fertilization is complete and embryonic development has begun. The zygote immediately begins dividing, a process known as cleavage forming a compact cluster of cells known as the marula. As it travels from the ampulla toward the uterine cavity, the divisions continue. By day four, the marula develops into a blastocyst, a fluid-filled structure with two key compartments, the inner cell mass, which will become the embryo, and the trophoblast, which will give rise to the placenta. Before the blastocyst can implant, it must first hatch from the zona pellucida, the glycoprotein shell that once protected the early embryo. This process, called zona hatching, typically occurs around day five or six. The blastocyst secretes enzymes that thin and weaken the zona until it finally breaks free. Only once the blastocyst has fully emerged can it begin interacting with the uterine lining. Without hatching, implantation is impossible. In about 1-2% to of pregnancies, implantation occurs outside of the uterus, a condition known as an ectopic pregnancy. Most ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tubes, but they can also implant in the cervix, ovaries, or even the abdominal cavity. These pregnancies are non-viable. The embryo cannot survive to term outside the uterus. As the ectopic pregnancy grows, it can rupture surrounding tissues, leading to severe internal bleeding and potentially life-threatening complications. Early detection and medical intervention are critical to safeguarding the health of the pregnant individual. Treatment focuses on preserving their life and well-being, as ectopic pregnancies cannot result in a viable birth. Once the blastocyst successfully implants in the uterine lining, placental development begins. Fluid within the embryo's cavity increases and two critical cell populations emerge the trophoblast, which will form the placenta, and the embryoblast, which will give rise to the embryo itself. 
Around day six post-fertilization, the trophoblast begins to proliferate rapidly, differentiating into two layers, the inner cytotrophoblast and the outer syncytiotrophoblast. The placenta is an extraordinary organ, the vital interface between the pregnant individual and the developing fetus. It consists of two main parts, the fetal portion, derived from the chorionic sac, which we talked about, and the maternal portion, formed from the uterine lining. The placenta performs multiple essential functions. It supports metabolism and glycogen synthesis, facilitates the exchange of oxygen, nutrients, and waste, and allows the transfer of certain medications and even some pathogens. It also helps protect the fetus by transferring maternal antibodies, and it acts as a temporary endocrine organ, secreting hormones such as human chorionic gonadotropin. Extending from the placenta is the umbilical cord, a lifeline that delivers essential nutrients and oxygen directly to the growing fetus. Within the cord are two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. The arteries carry deoxygenated blood and waste products from the fetus, while the vein brings oxygen-rich blood and nutrients back from the placenta. This efficient circulatory system supports fetal development throughout the entire pregnancy. Surrounding the embryo, and then later the fetus, is the amniotic cavity, a fluid-filled sac that provides a protective environment. It is lined by the amniotic membrane, which secretes amniotic fluid, a clear, slightly alkaline liquid essential for fetal growth and development. The fetus is continuously interacting with the surrounding amniotic fluid, swallowing around 400 milliliters each day. Once ingested, the fluid is absorbed into the fetal bloodstream through the digestive and respiratory systems. Meanwhile, fetal waste products cross the placental membrane into the maternal blood within the intervillous space, where they are cleared by maternal circulation. To maintain fluid balance, the fetal kidneys filter excess water from the bloodstream, excreting it into the amniotic sac as urine. Because fetal urine makes up a significant portion of amniotic fluid, analyzing this fluid through procedures like amniocentesis can reveal critical information about fetal health including enzyme function, amino acid levels, hormone profiles, and even chromosomal abnormalities. In this way, amniotic fluid serves not only as a protective cushion, but also as a powerful diagnostic window into fetal development. In the next episode, we'll dive into gastrulation, the moment when the embryo transforms from a simple disk of cells into a three-layered structure, setting the stage for the development of all organs and tissues. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.